I hear some people come out to say that isn't that the reason why there's this beef between the current administration and the formal governor of, um, let's say, Kogi State? Or isn't that the reason why there's still some beef between the current gov um, pres administration and some other person because they decided to contest that same position in the same party and refused to let go when some of the persons no, but did. at that time Tinubu was not even the president so i don't even think we can equate the situations he wasn't the president they were all contesting they right. were all on the same playing level they had the right to step down or refuse to step down so then for some other person that refused to step down that was the um insinuation that okay so you refused to step down and you decided to contest that position so that's why there's this beef do you agree I don't think that Tinibu is that petty. If he is, then it would be very disappointing. But somebody who can sit and say, I don't, I don't watch Facebook anymore. I don't do Twitter because if I go there, they just abuse me. So I've decided to let that go. You know, that's how I see him. So what is, what, is there a tradition behind carrying the load on the shoulder? Well, I've heard people say that the head is supreme, so it's good not to load it, but to put it on the shoulder. Okay. But having carried load on my shoulder, I know that it is healthier for me and I can carry much more mm. than I can on my head. I've done the two and I know how it feels. If you are climbing a hill with plenty of yam on your head or firewood, you think you are growing short with every step you are sinking and getting shorter but when it's on the shoulder you don't feel that compression you can actually move it from left to right and give the right some rest and move it again from left to right you know and uh, that way it's easy and then you get home you are less tired and you don't feel compressed <music>
The question I ask myself regularly is that, are we really prepared for the change or are we very comfortable wallowing in the state in which we are, in which we have been? Nigeria was not rosy when he took over. Things had gone bad. I had known years before the uh, 2023 elections that Nigeria was bankrupt. We kept borrowing. For those who follow budgets and do budget analysis, who would understand when your country is using 80% of its revenue to service debt, not to pay, service debt, then you know that the next cycle of budget, you're going to be in the red. And that is where you found the country. So bearing that in mind, bearing in mind that we are all actors in this change, then we should know that the way we are, our mindset, our behavior is not pointing to a solution so soon. I'll tell you why I'm saying this. Right. I think that even at the grassroots level, we are good at bleeding one another. We just need a little excuse before Tarodo three pieces will be 100 naira. <laughs> we just need a little breathing space before queues will start growing in the filling stations as a result of hoarding. I tell you sincerely, I have not seen any reason why the few times we have had those long queues and scarcity have occurred. If it is not for the mere reason that the marketers have been hoarding just to keep the price where it is. So when I look at the way we are, the way we treat one another, the way we exploit, extort, bleed one another, it makes me wonder. When I see corruption from grassroots level, of even from infancy, <laughs> when it comes to Nigerians, to adulthood, it makes me wonder, this change that we are looking for, do we think it is magic? We have to work it. And so if we want to see change soon, then we need to work harder on ourselves. We cannot keep the lifestyles we used to keep before. We have been very extravagant at Are you all talking levels. about Nigerian citizens or also you're talking about the leaders right now? From leadership to grassroots level is what I'm addressing right now. Because those people are leadership emerge from the grassroots. They came out of our families. They didn't fall from Jupiter or from Mars. And so they emerge there with the habits formed from where they are coming from. It's really a trickle few who have had influences that have made them different from what, let me call it the general trend, is. Nigerians can go and borrow money and throw party. Normal. Party is not an investment. Except for those who think that they will come and spray them and they will make more than they put in. Hmm. But how many people in the village are doing wedding and then they will go and say, bride, groom, come and dance. Uh, family of the groom, come and spray. Uh, friends of the groom, come and spray. Work colleagues of the bride, come and spray. Why are you doing that lavish wedding when you could just go, take your oath, swear to one another till death do you part? If you must entertain 10, 15, 20 people, and let everybody go. Then you go and start your home. No. We must block road. That is how most of us are. I know women who would not feed well even in pregnancy. Because they are saving to buy copion less that they will wear during the naming ceremony. That's the mindset. We are so tuned to materialistic things that. Now it is time to cut down Wahala. And it is from family level to the leadership level. This is a time when we can't afford to live the way we lived before. We need to fix this country. As individuals who have had issues, because the nation is like a human being, it can fall sick, it can die. It can prosper and flourish and blossom and thrive and even reproduce. Right. Just like we do. But what happens, for instance, when I'm diagnosed with cancer? 
Am I still going to eat sugar like I like? Am I still going to feast on red meat like I want? Am I going to still walk around the clock like I used to? Am I going to not exercise? Am I, you know, things have to go and new things have to come that will enhance recovery. Mm. Are we doing that in the country? Okay, maybe because at the grassroots, people are arm twisted. We don't have the knife to cut the meat. So we are compelled. And that is why there is more responsibility on the leadership. In any case, they should be leading by example. Right. But we are not seeing that happening. So when we talk about, are we seeing this change soon? Those are the things that, you know, spark in my mind. And I'm like, hmm, this change, oh, the person we voted for really looks like he knows what he wants from the way he spoke to us during the campaigns. Okay. So now let's go back to the fact that you talked about cutting costs. Yes. You still also hear the government tell you to cut your coat or cut your um, fabric according to your size and all. But then most people would wonder, why do you tell us to cut costs but you are not speaking to yourself? 90 billion naira um, spent on hard trip. Is that cutting costs? Is that, um, is that part of... Baby steps of pain. Let me borrow President Bola Metinubu's word. Let's keep um, managing. Keep managing. It will get better soon. Keep taking that baby steps of pain. Mm -hmm. And keep, um, at that time when you have diabetes, don't go for sugar. Mm -hmm. Why not go for um, more healthier drinks? But you still hear people say, bros, you're telling us that. Tell yourself that too. Tell your cabinet members that also. Yeah. You know, I know that... Uh... 90 billion for Hajj is extravagant for a country that is struggling with very many challenges. I also know that Tinibu has a listening ear. We only need to make noise about it and he will redress. He has been redressing steps since he came into power uh, in an exemplary manner. And I think that even on this one, if people can be vocal about it, something will go. I believe that. And so I'm lending my voice to that of Nigerians to say 90 billion for going for Hajj. It's extravagant. Can we do something else with that money that will help us? I know that Nigeria is a very religious country. Right. But if it is going to cost us that much, then we need to ask, is that God's desire for this nation? All that money, is it coming to Nigeria or is going out? Those are questions we should be asking ourselves. And that should make us put pressure on the government. Sadly, the gross beneficiaries of the 90 billion are the very ones who are crying the most. Mm. We are hungry, we are hungry. Take 9 billion and go for hard. You collect 10 aeroplane, go, come. You continue your hunger. Can you not also tell leadership, no, thank you? Don't we know how to say no? There are moments you say no. It's not every time you see a gift you collect. Check the ramification of the gift you are collecting. If it's going to affect you adversely tomorrow, say no, thank you. We were taught from childhood to say no, thank you. But then some of these people will say that's just a budget fight for corruption because the 90 billion that you're talking about, it's... I still have to pay some. It's not like I'm, it's, I'm going there for free. So because I asked some of them and then they said, it's not like they're giving me the thing for free. So I don't know what you, are, you guys are talking about. I'm still going to pay for it. But, and then some other persons will just say, it's just the conduit, conduit pipe for corruption. And I agree with, with the points of view. What we should do as the end beneficiaries of that gesture. I know that the Islamic community in Nigeria is very organized. Can they come out with the same media with which I have seen them vigorously pursue other campaigns to say, Dinibu will not want, thank you. Throw it back, put it in the uh, national revenue and use it to address issues that are worrying us in our daily lives. I'm sure that he will listen. But if we don't do anything and we know yet that it's a conduit, then they will get away with it. And this is the time, honestly, I know that when it comes to religious matters, we are very careful. It's like touching a sore tooth. But in this instance, 
Let us even remove the tooth. It's good to touch the sore tooth at this point because that is the pathway to recovery. Hmm. We need to say no. All right. So let's um, take other matters. If you go to the um, some of our headlines this morning, the Nigerian Tribune says, one year in office, mm. economic pains, hardship unintended, as the federal government apologizes to Nigerians, says Tinobo Lane Foundations for Nations Growth. And then on the flip side, uh, that's the Punch newspaper says, first anniversary, Tinobu are direct 47 ministers to showcase scorecards. As the president plans low-key celebration, ministers begin sectoral briefing today. Let's get your thoughts with regards to all of this. The ministers coming out to say, okay, we are sorry about the sufferings, the hardship. Yes, we see it also, so we are sorry about it. But then on the other side, most people will complain, over 40 of them. But yet you get to see few of them's achievement. And then some other ones, you just begin to wonder, do we actually have a minister in this ministry? What are your thoughts in this regard? How in would you fact, support them? there are ministries you don't even know exist. Yes, <laughs> right. Because you've never seen them, you've never had them. Like what's going on? I am, I've spent a lot of years in the development sector. I believe in monitoring and evaluation. If we do not monitor and evaluate, then we don't know where we stand in terms of the journey going forward. And so what I have admired about this administration is the desire to monitor the ministers and do that early, not those who are appointed like lifetime ministers for the, you know. So it's a good idea. It's positive. That's the way to go, including governors. Everyone should be evaluated. None should be left unassessed because that's the only way the administration can tell whether they are moving in the right direction, whether they are moving in time. Because four years, no foul, hmm. one year, don't go. So we have three, maybe two, because campaigns and everything we know, the fourth year is really like hmm. not a performing year in Nigeria. So this is the time, truly speaking, to assess the ministers and to take out those who are not performing. And we don't want 50% pass mark because 50 in this instance is not a pass. Anyone who can score 75 and above is the one who stays back because that's the one who has shown that they know what they're doing. They came in purposefully to impact positively on Nigeria. Anything else should go. Mm. They need to show that they have performed 75%. Tinubu cannot be the one doing the policy, the implementation. He is there supervising, delegating and everything. He understands that the, on, the head that wears the crown is where the unease lies. And that's why since he took over, he hasn't blamed any regime. I've not heard him say I inherited A or I inherited B. I blame this government for, you know, putting Nigeria. No, no, no. He's not transferring blames. He's carrying everything on his shoulders. That shows a strong man. That shows a man who is determined to work, to make change happen. And so these ministers get evaluated. Anyone who doesn't score well gets out because Tinibu cannot do the work. I remember there was a time he was complaining before they had the retreat that some of them were still at home receiving visitors and throwing parties because of having been uh, nominated as ministers. Like, I keep wondering, you get a ministerial appointment and people stream in congratulations. So congratulations for what? You are getting more responsibility. It's a job. It's daunting. People should come and meet you broken on your knees, seeking God's wisdom to see you through. Now, after four years or whatever period you serve, when you have a good scorecard, you don't even need to call for the celebration. Nigerians will celebrate you. But that is not what we've seen in most cases. Are you going to mention names or ministries? That, well, I have gone on the news. I know that... Uh, Power is having challenges as usual. We haven't started enjoying electricity, even though we can see that the bills are 
metamorphosing. Right. I think the best thing would have been to invest in the infrastructure and make change happen. So when you put extra charges on me, I have good reason to pay. But I haven't seen service. My pay is already increasing. Mm. If you want us to be stakeholders or shareholders, sell the shares to us. Let us put money in and revamp the sector. Don't make us pay for a service that is inexistent. And in this century, in this date and time, that when wind blows small, light will go for three days. I don't understand. This is, we've been talking new millennium since I don't know how many years ago. I think that sector needs fixing. And I think we need somebody in there that can fix it. So indirectly, you say the power minister should get what mark? Because you say 50 is not good. No, at 50 this is not good. But so, I'm not giving the 75 pass mark because I haven't felt that impact. Yet. Okay. I know that we have a new ministry, the blue economy. Right. It's a sector that I have always put my heart in because I've traveled around the world. I know what people do with their uh, waterways mm. and how much that generates, even if it is just for tourism. Not to talk of the economic value of shipping goods up and down, or even removing the sand that has filled everywhere. I never see sign of. So I would ask, what is that new ministry doing? What are they doing to help flood-related disasters? Like, I'm not feeling that ministry yet. Is it because it's new? I don't know. But... The fact that it is new and we put mm. somebody there, we mm. believe that the person knew the responsibility that comes with it. Mm. When they score well, Tinibu scores well, the administration scores well. But when they don't score well, they are rubbishing everything. And that's why those who are not working hard must go. We have gifts in Nigeria, human resource in abundance. We can get people who can deliver. Let us look for them and let them deliver for us. Security is in shambles. And security is the bedrock of every other thing. There is no investment that will make sense if we are not feeling secure and safe. Imagine the amount of money that is taken out of the economy when there is no nightlife in a city it's terrible when people cannot go to farm when they pay some bandits in order to go and farm and they cannot go and harvest when they harvest and they cannot take to market or they take to market and they have seen their children are kidnapped and they have to use the money to pay ransom what kind of life is that and why is it that the security situation is getting worse by the day? 20 people abducted during night raid in Abuja. How? So I have not seen things happening in that area at all. And those ministers need to account for all the security vote, for all the investment of confidence and trust that we have put in them to secure us and our property. Great. It's actually good that you've actually mentioned most, some of them. In fact, quite a number of them I'm still even in my mind, still wondering what is happening with the Ministry of Tourism, what is happening with the Ministry of um, Labour, what mm. is happening with the Ministry of quite a number of them. Like they are working in silos. These things can happen in silos. The point at which we are. There is a lot of intersection happening in these sectors because the entire system is sick. They need to collaborate. They need to network. If you are doing security and somebody else is doing tourism, mm. how do you collaborate? Because there are intersections there. Definitely. Labor. How do you work together? Tourism, blue marine. You know? So... They can't work in isolation. And I haven't seen any sign of them reaching out to one another.
to see how they can build consensus, have a common front of addressing pivotal issues that can then have ripple effect. But then does it actually bother you? So I have to bother him. Does it actually bother you the fact that when they were coming in, when they were nominated before getting the appointment, mm. you get so much enthusiasm. You get so much um, reports with regards to where they have worked before. For instance, you look at the Minister of Health. We mm. got so much reports with regards to where he was coming from, from Gavi and all of that. Mm. And then some other ministries, you get so many reports. But these other ministers where you don't hear too much, they're the ones that you just see do the work immediately. So what? at what point did they drop the ball? I think that uh, the fact that people are coming from somewhere and their CV looks rich does not really mean that they can deliver. People have to be passionate about Nigeria. It's not only about the CV. How far can you go? How far can you, you see? People need to disappear and let Nigeria be. But if it is all about my CV, then I'm going to come and everything I want to do has to be something that can further enhance my profile. And so Nigeria takes a second place. And some of them may feel like, wow, I've achieved, I've reached the peak. And so the balloon, all the air go come out. Mm. No more flying. Because they've reached the zenith of their career. They don't know that the appointment is not the zenith. It is the performance the to deliver on the, uh, the, uh, the terms of reference that they have. That is the zenith. You don't come and start celebrating when your armor is still on your body. Go and fight and come back and remove the armor and then celebrate. Ah. But some of them, no. It's like somebody who is running a race. Before they reach the finishing line, they've started celebrating. Number six, go come pass on. <laughs> Some people are playing ball. They just score one. They want to defend that one because they think they've won the game. Surprise, Why not, surprise. Why not wait until 90 minutes is over? Exactly. Hmm. So that is the problem that we are having with some of them. All right. So it's uh, all sorts of things put together. Some of them have not been in Nigeria for a while. They've been building CV outside Nigeria. So they don't know the complexities of our system. So they come and they are just overwhelmed. When they partake like they are sweating, they don't know what to do. We are used to it. <laughs> we know what to do when there's no light and we are sweating. We know that we should just breathe in and breathe out and continue to do our work till the power is restored. Some of them can't handle it. Then they will go, they will open tap, water no go come on. Ah! So we need to look inward and we need to bring on board people who can deliver, not people who are recommended by some godfathers that will be controlling what they're doing. And I have a feeling that people thought that this regime was like every other one, where people will come and make money and their cronies make money and then they go. They didn't know that ministerial appointment this time around was for performance. I have the and you, get to, and you get to show your scorecard. Yes. So right. they are just like, blind me. I didn't know this. And somehow they don't have the sense to look outside their circle for those who have the capacity to help them deliver because they didn't have it in them in the first place. Mm. And like they say, if it's in you, you will definitely deliver. It is, you cannot give what you don't have. Sure. Let's go on a quick break and when we return, we'll continue this conversation with Dorothy Nuhu Akinova. I'll see you later. Join us again. If you just joined us, this is The Conversation, reaching you from Kaftan's television city here in the nation's capital, Abuja. If you just joined us, you've actually missed out on the first part of the show, but then you can still join in this concluding segment as my guest um, on the show today is Dorothy Nuhu Akinova, who was SDP's presidential aspirant in the just-concluded 2023 elections. All right, before we went on that break, we've actually mentioned quite a number of things. But now let me ask you, mm. the fact that you contested in that election, last year's general election, mm -hmm. and you are still in the opposition party, from the opposition party, that's Social Democratic Party. Now, if you have to um, look at all that the ruling party has done in the last one year, 
as an opposition and as a Nigerian. And I ask you to um, give them, rate them um, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the lowest and 10 being the highest, as an opposition party and as a Nigerian who is also going to the same market using the same grocery store and, and retail uh, filling station, how would you rate them? Okay, first, uh, I did the camp. Oh, okay. And I joined the APC. Oh, really? Yes, I did. And so, but I can be objective. It doesn't stop me from being objective. Okay. By the time the ministers, like majority of them, are scoring below my pass mark, it means the administration is not getting a pass mark. Ah. So what is your pass mark? 75. Because that's the time we begin to feel the impact. And that 75 comes from delivery. It comes from integrity. It comes from credibility. It comes from engaging with Nigerians to let us know this month what are you doing and next month when you are telling us what you're doing in this new month you tell us last month how did you fare with the objectives you set that is how very detailed I would want to see governors it doesn't make sense for people to sit and plan and we are in the dark as though we do not know what's going we know what is going on. It is everybody in Nigeria who is feeling the bite. And everybody needs to hear what you're doing, how well you're coping. If you have challenges, what are they? Don't be surprised that the person you least expect will be the one who will provide the solution or suggestions on how you can move forward. We need to see all of these things happening. And like I said, when we were discussing the first segment, it also comes from how you're working as a team. Team means you are coming together. Not everyone facing one direction and going with it. It's not going to work. It won't work like that. So now give them from one to 10. What would you look at this administration? If you see President Bola Ametinubu, what would you tell him on the scale of one to 10? 3.5. Wow, that's poor. Yeah. Because I haven't seen the things that I need to see, but from a few ministers, most of the agencies don't have uh, management in place yet. I don't know if we've had up to 30% of the appointments done for the parastatals. Right. And those are close to the people. They make impact. So when they are not there, who is doing the work? How are we getting to address the issues that these parastatals would be addressing if the EDs are not in place and the board is not in place? All right. And how do we get feedback on how they are then performing so that we know that whatever resources are going in there are being used for us? We need to see them work. We need to hear them work. And that's why it is that poor the ambassadorial positions were dissolved. Hmm. We've not seen replacements. Hmm. How do we engage with the rest of the world in terms of diplomacy? There is so much happening every day at the global level. How do we engage if the ambassadorial uh, positions are still vacant? Who is acting then on our behalf? And then who owes us the feedback we need from what is going on? If we want the people in the economic sector and tourism to reach out to their international counterpart and learn one or two things. Who is going to facilitate that when the ambassadors are not there? All right. Um, during the first segment, I hear you say that even the governors should be um, they should be evaluated, evaluated, appraised, yes. And then if they're not doing well, they should be sent out of the window. But then some other persons will say the ministers they were appointed, so it's um, it's now the box stops right in front of the, um, the, the, the appointee. Mm. How about the governors? The people will kick them out. The constitution provides for a governor to be sent packing. We can send anybody packing. The conditions are there. In so reality, the, let's leave the constitution and talk about reality. No, How but do you if see we that don't happen? have the scorecard that will now anger the people enough to kick them out, 
How does that happen? How does that happen? We need the scorecard so that when we are talking, we are talking facts. We have civil society organizations that can champion those processes. And by the time they know that the process is there, they will sit up. They will not continue to take us for granted. The impunity just stinks. Hmm. It's very painful to see that we are all taken for granted. Despite our conscientization levels, despite our education levels and awareness level, despite the passion that we have to keep Nigeria together and keep it going. Some people just come, they grab, they just sit there. And there is nothing whatsoever to evaluate them on. We've had a governor once who was challenged. And what he said was that during campaign, he never promised anybody anything. What a fun tree is that? Let them get evaluated. Let the people see the scorecard. And you know, the budget also needs to be addressed. Right. Because if you are doing scorecard, you are doing it based on how much they've been given. To whom much is given, much is expected. Shouldn't we also talk about how much you, you're even able to bring out from your coffers? Because we always hear that no state is lazy or has that should come out and t tell us that they cannot produce or bring oh, out yeah. anything they, at all they, they need to be able to generate revenue you know so all of that is put together to, as a scorecard for them and then let the people decide if they are happy with it like that oh yeah now let them carry go but then they will see some other states that will be flourishing very soon and no one will tell them what to do mm. they will do it all right, let's um, shift a little bit and come back to talk about you and then we'll also talk about, um, because most times we always like to get um, to understand our unity in diversity. But let's first of all talk about you. I saw that um, report some time ago when um, you actually decamped to APC. And since then I was saying I would, ha would like to have this conversation with you. Hmm. What happened with SDP? Well, it didn't seem to move. It seemed like there was a force that was pulling things in two different directions. I didn't feel the life that I knew that SDP had the potential to express during the campaigns. I was not in a position to know if it was because there were no resources for us to ginger up and take the campaign forward. I know that there were delays or no meetings for some relevant stakeholders that should have had a conversation on how, as a party, the campaigns should move. And I just felt, no, I didn't come to White Horse mm. to come and just sit and fade out. I came to work and I have to be seen to be working. So when I didn't understand and I didn't feel the energy and I didn't feel us working, I decided to step out and then look for where to go pitch my tent and at that time there was labor party that was working very hard for most young people and for christians within the north central zone especially there was pdp which has been the party like family party <laughs> ah you know and so when i considered everything and i did my assessment of what is likely to happen. I'm very sensitive in the spirit. So I also do not just take decisions on face value. I really knew that the only person that would be good for Nigeria at this point in time would be someone who is humble. And Tinibu represented humility to me at that point. He wasn't arrogant. He was the most abused, the most rejected by the powers that are kingmakers in the country. 
And I thought, mm, there's something about this person. If everybody else is saying, no, change the naira, change the naira, and somebody comes and says, no, people will suffer. I'm like, this makes sense. So. But also when I looked at all the governors, senators, House of Rep members, and I checked what percentage was APC, what percentage was PDP, what percentage was uh, Labour or NMPP. APC had the largest number. And I said to myself, I don't think any APC governor is going to do something so that their party do not win. Instead, they are going to have to deliver. And so that gave me immediate, you know, like, this is what to watch out for. And their campaign was very visible. It was very loud, you know. I just see the women going up and down the place campaigning. It was very organized. And um, I also listened to Bola Metinibu, like I said, it's the first time anybody would come and campaign to my address, to my hearing, and say, it's going to be difficult, oh. I will make difficult decisions, so You will make sacrifices, so This is not for me alone. We have to do it together, oh. For me, that was exceptional, because it is something that I would do if I had the flag. Okay. I tell people the truth. We are zero. We need to sacrifice. We need to go through pain. No pain, no gain. Hmm. All right. So that is why I aligned myself with the APC. The fact that the, some of the principles aligned with mine. I saw the agenda that he had, the eight-point agenda, and it was also in sync with what I believed in. I liked his stand on inclusivity, you know, getting youth to be involved, women to be involved. Even though we've not seen the percentages play out yet. Right. Yeah. Um, and I also knew that they had the potential to win the elections. And if I wanted my agenda to see the light of day through a man that people cannot bend and fold the way they like. Someone who will say, I will do this and would keep focus and do it. And all the oligarchies can somersault and go and hang transformer if they like. He will do it. You know. So for me, that was tenable. Because in terms of resources, experience, age, you know, he had the strength to stand his own ground. And people will not be able to toss him around. It's not like he really needed people to endorse him or pay his campaigns to the point that they will now gag him. And he will not be able to do what he needs to do to bring Nigeria to where he wants Nigeria to be. All right. Yeah. Quite a number of questions I have from what you've just stated. Mm. But I would ask you, and I'd like you to take them in one breath. Mm -hmm. One, you had a presidential candidate mm. in your party, your formal party, SDP. Mm -hmm. That's the person of barrister um, or prince, Adewoli Adebayo. Mm -hmm. And I hear you say Tinubu is a man you cannot bend, regardless of the oligarchies around. Mm -hmm. And he's a principled person. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the party, mm -hmm. APC, which mm -hmm. happens to be more mm -hmm. organized and principled mm -hmm. than the SDP. So are you saying that all of these qualities mm -hmm. that you've reeled out from the person of the current president mm -hmm. was not seen Mm. in the presidential candidate of the um, Social Democratic no, 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 Party. No, 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 no. Not. That's one. And then two, I hear you also say that, talk about how um, the campaigns went and then you knew that the governors were rallying around their party. Did you actually move to the APC because it was the winning team? Well, I gave reasons and it was not just one. For why it was tenable for me, it was not just that his principle that can stand his ground. I talked about experience. Right. I talked about resources. And I talked about capacity in terms of the people he has even built. You know, that have come to be governors, to be justices, to be, you know. He has his mentees all over the place. So that's what I'm asking. All of these so, qualities were in, 
were lacking or inadequate? Inadequate, maybe, but not that lacking. Because I could look at my candidate when I was in SDP and say, okay, he's not been a governor before. He's not been a minister before. Tinubu has been a governor. He's been a senator. He's raised people who are governors and who were actually governors at the time at which the campaigns were going on. So it was very likely that the elections were going to be won by him. And I saw that he was really not loved by the people that me, I think, the oligarchies that have brought Nigeria to its knees. They didn't like him. And that sent me a message to say, whoa, if they don't like this man, it means uh, they know that they can't push him around. And so that just won me over. Because I want to be <laughs> where I will win. You know, it's very important for me, but not winning for winning sake. If it was winning for winning sake, I'd have done labor or PDP because I'd have been much more at home there. Being in APC was just positioning myself for plenty of persecution, which I went through. But because I was convinced that that was the right thing to do at that time, I took the persecution in good strides. I remember after the elections, my senior brother sent me a message and he said, you were right. Congratulations. Because I talked to them, including from scriptures, why I moved to where I moved. And there are other things that I can't talk about on national TV because they are very sensitive and delicate. All right. And I still have an ambition. Ah, that's what, that, that, as, if, <laughs> as if you just drew out the next question from my mouth. I was going to ask, are we seeing you in the ballot uh, or seeing your uh, posters around? And is it going to be from APC? Because I hear the chairman of um, APC say that um, leave what a PDP and Labour Party they are doing, leave the alliances they are do going through. We are strategizing to ensure that Tinubu goes back there again in 2027. So if we are going to see you in the ballot, is it in, in APC or some other party? I'm not again? sure yet because I'm waiting for the scorecards. If they don't meet up, you know, I'll reconsider my position. Because we know in Nigeria, anyway, the parties are not ideologically driven. It's just interest. So if I see a party that has an agenda that I believe in, I'll move with them. Just like I did with APC. So what if the party is still APC and the present administration or the present president is going back again? I look ballot? for some other things to come out for that so you, can you won't want to contest. I with would contest. Him. Oh, on that position, I mean. If he's delivering, no. Anyone who is delivering, I wouldn't contest with them. It doesn't have to be Tinibu alone. No. If the things I want to see done are being done, I won't contest. Okay. But if I see done, see say, you know, they move ah. I Regardless will contest. of the fact that is in your party, yes. you would contest the position. I'm also. sure that people are going to contest. It's not only me. Okay. Yeah, it's because I'm sitting with you. I'm sure that people are not seeing their own ambitions and they are busy working out strategies. Right. But it is also healthy. That is democracy. Mm. And that puts him on his toes and makes sure he delivers when he knows that uh, there can be opposition even from within. But don't you think that is going to actually, that's, I hear some people come out to say that isn't that the reason why there's this beef between the current administration and the formal governor of um let's say kogi state or isn't that the reason why there's still some beef between the current gov um, pres administration and some other person because they decided to contest that same position in the same party and refused to let go when some other person no, but did. at that time Tinubu was not even the president so i don't even think we can equate the situations he wasn't the president they were all contesting they right. were all on the same playing level. They had the right to step down or refuse to step down. So then for some other person that refused to step down, that was the um, insinuation that, okay, so you refused to step down and you decided to contest that position. So that's why there's this beef. Do you agree? I don't think that Tinibu is that petty. If he is, then it would be very disappointing. 
But somebody who can sit and say, I don't, I don't watch Facebook anymore. I don't do Twitter because if I go there, they just abuse me. So I've decided to let that go. You know, that's how I see him. Like he knows that opposition will be there. He knows the insults will be there. He knows that people will lambast him left, right and center and bala blue him. But he is determined to face what he wants to do. And he does it. All right. He's not distracted by whether uh, Dino Melai is falling on the stage and mimicking what is or what is not. He's not going to waste his energy on that. He is investing the energy he has in his assignment as he understands it and as he's committed to deliver it. And that is the kind of person that I see in him. Not someone who will start wasting energy, hunting down people because they disagreed with him. Oh, so what true. would he do to Labour Party? Send them on exile? He's been on exile. He fought the military. He understands democracy better than most of the people who contested in that campaign. And that's something I didn't say. I have followed Tinubu since when he was governor in, Niger State, in uh, Lagos State. Because I lived in Lagos State. I know a classmate of mine who is Igbo, who was commissioner in Lagos State. That would not happen in Niger State, for example. So I have followed him. I know his Nadeko exploits. I know how they fought or we fought because I did my own little bit to ensure that military goes away and that uh, 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 democracy is installed in Nigeria. I was in the UN a number of times to speak, to make sure that the military government is held accountable. All right. Our time is fast, but if you can help us in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask you a very personal question. Mm. Are you open to getting any appointment? And which one are you actually looking forward to? Which, which, which position or which organization or department or ministry would be your best? Well, I've been in the development sector. And if I get appointed to a ministry that has to do with development, environment, uh, women's health and rights, all those are in the area of my capacity, you know, but... I didn't do this because I want an appointment. So if I don't get any appointment, I'm still good. I have other ways of making sure I send my contribution to the administration. And I'm happy to use those channels to send my contribution to the government. Right. And in a way, that frees me to then contest when I want. <laughs> I like. All right. Before we yeah. let you go, because we always like to um, understand or appreciate our unity diversity, because I know that you are from Bagi, yes, right? Yes, I'm Bagi. So now let's um, give us in next two minutes, talk to us about the Bagi people. What is what is beautiful about the Bagi people, especially the fact that they have to carry their loads right on their shoulder. And then you end the show by speaking to Bagi people in the Bagi language. You know, I believe that when we are reduced to the load on the shoulder, we are not being fully represented. Of course, I did that and I still could. But as I sit here, I don't sit with any load on my shoulder. And so it's nice if people begin to see us beyond that load on our shoulder. I, exactly. What, I'm, what I mean is, mm. what exactly is the significance? What does it mean if you have, because most people will say, I prefer to carry it on my head because of X, Y, Z, this is the tradition. So what is, what, is there a tradition behind carrying the load on the shoulder? Well, I've heard people say that the head is supreme, so it's good not to load it, but to put it on the shoulder. Okay. But having carried load on my shoulder, I know that it is healthier for me and I can carry much more mm. than I can on my head. I've done the two and I know how it feels. If you are climbing a hill with plenty of yam on your head or firewood, you think you are growing short with every step. You are sinking and getting shorter. But when it's on the shoulder, you don't feel that compression. You can actually move it from left to right and give the right some rest and move it again from left to right, you know. 
and uh, that way it's easy and then you get home you are less tired and you don't feel compressed okay so for me it's how comfortable i feel carrying load especially one that is heavy for a long distance all right um so generally about the baggy people what is it to love about the baggy people humility ah i think baggy people are very very humble and I think that our humility is taken for granted most of the time. And sometimes it's weaponized. I have seen people who are always saying, oh, baggy people, they are so peaceful, they are so humble, only because they want to exploit the baggy. And because they've said that and it's a good quality, the baggy would then recline and say, okay, you know, we've always been like this, so let's just let peace reign. Mm. You know, so... I know we are humble, we are peaceful, hardworking, credible people, very transparent. That's why they say, let's do it the, you know, the baggy way. Let's do it very transparent. But uh, I think that we need to also put our foot down and not allow people to come in, exploit us, uh, extort us, abuse us, because we want to give the impression that we are humble. You know, so I have had to jump out of that box so that when it is time to be vocal, I'm vocal. When it is time to, you know, pursue a goal, diligently I do that. And um, people may think otherwise of my humility. But the fact is that I won't sit and watch my rights eroded. All right. And I'm trying to educate other Bagi people to also do the same. All we right. won't insult, we won't fight, we won't do things that are disorderly or out of law, illegal. Mm. But we'll do everything that is right to mm. defend and protect that which is ours. All right. So what is the um, food, the best food of the Bagi people? And if I am looking as probably from some other places, from some other culture. If, I'm, if you have someone who is looking at, he wants to marry someone from Bagi, tell that man or that woman why you should look at that tradition about the Bagi people, why they are just best amongst all. Like I said, humility, because it brings about tolerance, you know, and in marriage, if people are not tolerant, it's going to scatter in no time. All right. And if they are not humble, then they don't say sorry, they don't say please, they don't say thank you. And those key words keep relationships. So I, I think that uh, those are the qualities that can keep relationships, not only marriage, but at work, in marketplaces, you know, neighbors. And that's an essential quality in most baggy people. And, so, uh, so, so what's the food? food? Sanji. Ah. Mm. If you have a sanje and uh, okra soup or garden egg soup, you know, the way we make it traditionally. All right. You can't exchange that for any jollof rice. <laughs> in the world. I like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful mm. time here having this conversation. But before we let you go, just say um, something to Bagi people, especially in Bagi language. To embrace peace and all. Fellow, Zam. Majinubolo Gayuku Zewi Nagmadai M Bayenu Maye Yabi Yuku Bumado Yawad Nado Nabai Yabwabi Yi Agba Yi Yila Kwan Yewi a Salasi. Okay. Tell them to keep watching Kaftan Television. Kaftan Television Jianu Suku Suku Safe Fiawo and Abari Che Abu Bajin Lun Yze Fiji Kaftan television thank you so much thank Dorothy. you no, very I very know much that. it's been a wonderful time it's always a pleasure having this it's talk been a you. while and so i'm happy to to have spent this time with you Annabelle. likewise thank yeah. you for coming all right, viewers, that's where we end this conversation for today. We have been chatting with Dorothy Nuhu Akinova, who was SDP presidential aspirant in 2023 election. It's been a wonderful time here on The Conversation. Sure, you must have been rightly educated, entertained, and informed, and especially what she said about the baggy people. 
they are very good and they're people that you will always want to love remember she said humility is one of their traits so don't step on their toes just because they're humble i'll see you again next time my name is annabelle oji good morning nigerians mm -hmm.